as you start your own business. Starting your own business is one of the best personal development exercises you will ever do, even if you don't think it's about personal development, because you are your biggest asset. So we need to know who you are, where are your superpowers, where are the things you're not strong at, because you, if you're spending time in those, you're not going to move forward. From The Totem Project, this is Full Moon Women, a community and a podcast about the inner lives of women. On today's episode, I speak with Marianne Cantwell, the author of the best-selling book, Be a Free-Range Human. In her wildly popular TEDx talk entitled The Hidden Power of Not Always Fitting In, she illuminates how so many of us secretly feel like we never fit in and why that is a really, really good thing. The talk has been watched by half a million people worldwide, and I think I know why. Marianne believes in us. She believes in you. She believes you have every right to dream and to build a new life based on that dream. I'm Jamie Younger, your host. On Full Moon Women, we publish episodes in couplets. The first episode in each couplet is a woman's story, something personal from her inner life. The second episode in the couplet is a conversation with someone who can give us a greater context and hopefully a greater appreciation for the storytelling woman's story. Our last episode was with Jake Kaiser, a woman who followed her crazy dreams and ended up leaving her city life to become a farmer. Jake's story is about listening to that whisper inside that says, you are meant for something else. Her story is about launching yourself into the unknown and trusting that you'll find your way. Today, I speak with Marianne Cantwell. Marianne talks about how to listen to that whisper inside of you, how to safely and effectively launch yourself into a new business or career or lifestyle, and the benefits of dreaming, even if you never do anything about it. In listening to your TEDx talk, I was really moved by the concept that most people are really constantly looking for a place where they can fit in. And your insights and your work and and your writings are about helping people create a life that fits them Mm. as opposed to helping people search for a career or a lifestyle that they can basically fit themselves into. And I'm wondering if you could just start off and talk about your own journey of trying to fit in Mm -hmm. and then how that eventually you figured out that you that wasn't going to work and how to make a life that fits for you. For me, I feel like it's been since I was a kid. I grew up in Australia, um, but my father was from the UK. My mother was from a little island called Mauritius. She spoke French. My accent was completely weird, a real hybrid. So as a kid, I had no way of pretending I fully fitted where I lived. So I grew up with this idea of, just being a slight outsider Um, in terms of my personality. I was a nerd. I was really had special interests. I was deeply into things that were maybe not that cool. So I grew up with this feeling of not really understanding how is it that people manage to fit in. And I thought that the aim of my life was to find a place where I'd fit. So I went to university and I thought, oh, maybe I'll find a place here. And it was always kind of a fit, but never a full one. I ended up getting into the working world. I moved to London. And that's when it was very clear that the idea of me finding a career where I would fit wasn't working. You know, I didn't feel the same as the people in the office with me. I didn't feel like I had a full home in the industry I was in. That's when I started to realize that this lifelong like, attempt to fit in was actually me leaving pieces of myself at the door in order to be perceived as fitting in. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm wondering, can you recall a moment where you're like, I kind of fit, like I'm sort of 70% fitting into this box, but not this other part of me. Do you have a vivid memory of a moment like that? I can actually give you examples of in my business. I'll even go there. So when I'd started out running my own thing, 
I found myself in this sort of online entrepreneurship world that was very focused on very linear solutions. So it would be like all the people around me would do would be to focus on all reading the same things or watching the same videos or talking about increased revenues and like all these tactics. And I found that interesting, right? But I was someone who always saw the gray area. I would prefer to read philosophy. I would read novels. I would be really interested in sociology. And so I felt like I would go as, again, this person who had such a breadth of interest. So I remember going into in-person conferences at the time. And if I would raise something that I was deeply interested in, people would look at me like I was an alien because all that matters to them at the time was what's the best tactic to hit the next revenue? That's what we're all about. So for me, I just never felt like I fit that. I was more about lifestyle as well. I was like, how can I create loads of space in my life? How can I have space to you know, make my art, which I do just for myself, just for the joy of it? And there wasn't a conversation about what if we do things for the joy of them? So if I'm getting this right, you were, like many people, leading a nine to five lifestyle. You're working in London. You have this job. And then you say, OK, I'm now going to make the leap and I'm going to basically become an entrepreneur and I'm going to do my own thing. And then when you got there, you came up against the same kind of single point focused <laughs> kind of yes. way of thinking so the form had changed, but how it felt for you was pretty similar. Absolutely. Yes. I thought I was leaving the job world to create something that would be totally on my terms. And that is true. But what I learned is that isn't handed to you. You know, I had to really sculpt that and craft that because I always say, you know, you are more unique than any job description or any business description will be. So at some point you have to craft your own version of it in order to find the place where you feel like you can be you. Just thinking about listeners who are in a quote unquote normal job <laughs> environment right now, and they, they haven't even made the leap over to like entrepreneurship, let's say. You made that leap at some point. You made that decision what gave you enough courage or inspiration or mojo to do that? What was happening for you? Did you just have a burnout moment of the nine to five or was it more of a positive inspiration? So it was a bit of both. So for I changed jobs over the years. I used to work for a big media company and then I worked for a small consultancy in London. And I thought that the last job I had was going to be the answer. That was the place I'd fit. And it was better. It was certainly better than working for a, a well-known multinational. Uh, but I was working all hours. I felt like I was doing a lot more than I was paid for in terms of impact on the business. And I was thinking, this is really silly. I could start a company like this and do it myself, right? So it started from that place. And I thought, well, I'd always wanted to get into personal development work of some sort. And so I ended up training as a coach on the side, uh, very openly with my boss, who was very supportive of it, thinking it would be a side gig. And as I did that, I realized, I think I'd love to quit my job and create a portfolio career where I get to have this blend of things I love to do, which is consulting on your know, marketing strategy, et cetera. And career coaching, helping people, you know, find their way, get jobs that fit them better. And so I had this wonderful plan. And so I convinced my boss to let me go part-time and begrudgingly, he's like, I don't like this, but you can. And so I was all set to do this. And this was just before the last major financial crash. So I want to say 2008 or nine. And I was all set to do this. And I took a vacation and we I went with my then partner to the Middle East. We were in the desert in Jordan, in the middle of nowhere. We get back from that vacation, get to a hotel and turn on the TV. And I'm literally seeing pictures of my whole neighborhood I worked in. And I was like, why is this on TV? And it was the Lehman Brothers crash. And we were behind Lehman Brothers. And so I was watching the place I walked by every day and the windows I would look into from my office. We backed onto Lehman's and everyone was out of a job. All these people had left. 
And so I went back to work because I still had my job and I was watching their pot plants die in the windows. And so I'm like, these people who were working until 10 p.m. plus at night, and I knew that because I was doing that too, this is the thanks they get. This is what you get for doing it right. And so suddenly I, I was like, I have to change this. Uh, a few weeks after that, I was helping out with a trade show we were doing for work. I pull my back while arranging some tables and I'm in incredible pain. And I go to work the next day and I'm on the tube in London and I can barely stand. Like I'm crying on the tube. I get to the office and I was like, I tell my boss, I'm not going to be able to make it through today. I have to go home. And he says, there's no way you can go home today because we were doing an important pitch planning. And I was like, no, no. I said, I've done the work. Our junior guys got it. I promise, like, I can leave. It'll, it'll all get done. And he's like, you can't leave. And I was like, that was it. That was the moment. I walked back in. I wrote out a letter. I handed all my work over to my colleague. And I literally handed my resignation in and walked out. And I wasn't ready. My plan was six to nine months in the future to go part-time properly. And that's where I was suddenly having to figure things out. And that's what made me take the leap in the end. And then you eventually wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And I really love the title, Be a Free Range Human, Escape the 9 to 5, Create a Life You Love and Still Pay the Bills. How did you come to write that book? That was a few years after I had started. I never intended to start out and help people quit their jobs and grow their own business. So when I started, I actually started out career coaching, helping people get jobs they wanted to get, uh, figure out what do you really want to do as a career, like all the stuff I was really good at. But the biggest question I kept getting is, how did you quit your job? And I thought, well, it wasn't that hard. Like I figured it out, made it work. And so I started talking a little bit about that. I wrote a blog called Free Range Humans, and that became the thing everyone wanted to know about. And so I ended up morphing my then career business into figure out what you want to do as your own boss. And after a year or so, people say, could you help us start the business? And I was like, sure. And so that I added that in as well. It was very much, I think, of the time of people really reconsidering, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is there another way? And how would you define the term free range human at this moment in time? At this moment, to me, it's someone who has crafted their career and their life in a way where they get to work and live on their own terms and they get to be themselves in what they do. The second part is key. Yes. It used to, for me, it used to be about travel. So a big part was I was fully nomadic for quite a few years with my you know, very early digital business um, <laughs> before everyone was doing that. Um, but I realized that travel is only one component. Plenty of people read the book and have no desire to travel with their laptop. You know, it's a really about how do I do this on my own time with the space I need, do something that really feels like me and where I can show up as myself. Yeah, I suppose that first starts with tapping in and noticing that you aren't being yourself fully wherever you are. That's a big moment of consciousness. Um, is that part of the work that you do with people? Is people even becoming aware of that? Or do you feel like the people who come to you already know that? When it comes to people who want to make a change, there's two different categories I see. One of them is I have a billion ideas, but I don't know what would be right for me. Even if it is right, where do I start? So I was that person with like, I have like four different ideas. Are they going to work? How do I do it? Let me do this energetically, it feels quite high. Right. Like you're just like up and spinning. The other category is I don't know what I love and I feel like I've lost myself. And that's the other one, which is I don't have any ideas. And the only thing I want to do is sit on a beach and do nothing. And they are both the same problem in a lot of ways. How so? Well, one of them thinks they have no ideas and one of them thinks they have too many ideas. But essentially, it comes down to understanding who you are, 
understanding your, what I call your superpowers. What is it that you bring and that you do naturally and where you shine over and above the skills you have learned? And we all have those. These are things that are innate. We have them from childhood. And when you start to tap back into the joy of that and you, you start to see, huh, maybe the environment I'm in isn't letting me honor my superpowers. So I'll give you an example. For me, my superpowers are around empathy, um, around long-term future thinking. When I was working for a multinational organization, the idea of being able to feel the feelings of everyone around me was not helping me. I was overwhelmed all the time by feeling what people were feeling. The idea of how can we do it differently was not welcome because it was not a big organization with structures that were not changeable, right? And so I had learned that those things were not useful. As I started doing different jobs and ultimately my own business, today, those are things I get paid for to be able to read the person in front of me, even in a large group, if I'm running a group thing and say, be able to see what's going on with them and cut to the problem and who they are. I get paid to do that, right? And so that's what happens a lot when we, people think, I don't know how to decide. And once you crack that, honestly, that's when everything changes. It's when you start to go, I love what I do. I feel like I can be me because you're doing something that is what we call your best flow. So it's, again, it's very much self-discovery, you know, mixed, of course, with practicals. I'm imagining that some people listening are thinking like, okay, I sort of kind of have an idea of what my extra superpower things are, but I don't feel like things that might be welcome in the world maybe someone's blocked. They're like, okay, I'm aware of what it is, but what's the next step here? Because I don't feel where I would place that as a value in the world. I'd say two things to that. One is, respectfully, you're probably not aware. The reason is everyone, including me, no matter how successful you are in your job, if something isn't fitting, you're probably spending your life in your second best strengths and thinking they're your superpowers. And so when you're looking at those, a few things happen. One is, that little heart sink feeling starts. It's like, oh, I could totally do that, but oh, I have to do that, <laughs> right? Like this is where my value is. So the second thing to realize is um, I have a trait, like let's just say empathy, which we just used, that I think is lovely, but not valuable. That is how people feel about their superpowers, no matter what their superpowers are. Not all the time. Sometimes you have a happy coincidence where one of or two of your superpowers, maybe you've been praised for since you were a child. Maybe it's worked well for you. But the rest of them, you probably, like if someone is too outgoing and connects with people well, probably they were told to keep quiet as a child, right? Probably they were like, stop chatting at work all the time. And so you then get these messages that say, where is that of value? And the first thing I tell people to realize is, Everyone gets those messages. It is not your superpowers. It is what happens when we are told from a young age that something about us is too much or that something about us is not enough. So the first thing is recognizing that. And the second thing is go and start to look for evidence. Instead of looking for evidence why this thing isn't useful, go and look for evidence of people who get to use it a lot. And just put your detective hat on, pick one or two things and go and look. Now, you might think, I'll never get to do that. That's fine. All you're doing is you're retraining your brain to say, let me find a little bit of evidence that this thing has value in the world somewhere, because then we can start to make it have value in what you do. I love that, to go look for evidence yes. of something that would propel you towards what you really feel drawn to, or you feel that you have a strength in. Wow. You're making me pause and think of what I'm going to do tomorrow to go look for evidence of. It's energizing and challenging at the same time. And wow, to think, no doubt, especially in this age of where you can Google everything, you're going to find it if you really seek it. Yeah. And once it's in your head, you're like, I want go look at what you're reading. If you read a magazine, if you read things online, go and read between the lines of the stories of the people you're reading. You're going to find people who have your opposite superpowers and they'll make your heart sink because you're like, I need to be more like that. That is their story, right? They've probably spent their life thinking they should be more like you. That's what we see in our groups. We see people who are wildly successful people who have 
maybe struggle to fit in, people of all types. If someone is, say, hyper-organized and someone is hyper-creative, they'll say, I've always wanted to be like you. And so when you're reading a story of someone or listening on a podcast, one of the things you can train yourself to do is to look for similarities rather than differences. So where is there one little thing that I'm hearing in Jake's story that she might be very different from me, but there's this something there. Or go listen to someone else's story and start gathering your own evidence. It, uh, genuinely, it changes things. Yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, you just mentioned Jake and her story, and I'm curious just to break things down on a more practical level here. So thinking about Jake and her experience, she had a, a job that was stressing her out, that she wasn't really feeling at peace in herself. And then she starts having a fantasy farm life going on in her head. And she starts developing next steps that she can take and what her fantasy farm life is going to be like. I'm wondering if you can help people who maybe they are sitting here and they're going, okay, I'm willing to entertain the idea that there might be another life out there for me. And I have some inkling of what that might be. What are the next steps that you can tell people that could be helpful for them kind of moving out? Yes. I got to say, I listened to Jake's story and I have a page of notes because her story is an actual masterclass in what do we do with a dream? So I'm going to break down what I heard in Jake's story in terms of action. So I heard three parts to it. One of them was she actually had a dream, which was crazy. She was, you know, wearing her designer heels in a city and she was obsessed with living on a farm with chickens and possibly goats, right? Like totally crazy. Her friends rightly laughed at her and were like, that doesn't sound like you. She couldn't get out of her head. And there's this one thing she says that really got me, which is something like, I told myself, okay, this is crazy, but let me just draw out what my dream farm would look like. And that moment there where you take a dream and you take your dream seriously, even if just for an hour, that is powerful. That was step one. Step two what is the step that without this, I'm not sure she'd be doing it. And it was she told the right person. Often this is a coach, right? Uh, she was very lucky. She had a stepmother. And what she said about her stepmother was so resonant. She said, my stepmother is someone that if you tell her what you want, she will put you on that path. So she tells her the crazy story. Step two, you have to tell the right people. Tell the wrong people like your friends and they'll say, you're crazy. You'll never do that. Are you going to walk around a farm in heels? Right? Right. You're, it's not you. Tell the right people. And something happens. Her stepmother calls her up and says, I found you a farm. Now, does that normally happen? Probably not. But you, you'll have someone who says, this is a thing you could explore. Here's where you'd start. So you take it out and you draw it out. You start to tell people. And the third thing was that she actually then worked out how to do it. So I had a little email exchange with her because I f had an intuition that the practical side of this was not her getting a farm and then making money from that farm. And it certainly was not. It was her continuing on doing her PR work, but remotely. So the last step is you do it, but now we bring in practicals right? So we go from dreaming. So I always see it very visually. I imagine that in, when you're dreaming, you're up in the clouds. It's a beautiful place. Everything's wonderful. Nothing goes wrong up there. Then we bring our dream down to the ground and we start sketching it out. And then we bring it even more grounded and we take a breath and we tell the right people. And then the next part is we now have our feet on the ground and we do something. And that's what Jake did. And that's how ideas happen. Let me ask you about the, the second step, which is tell the right people. Yes. Talk to me about who the right people are and who the wrong people are. Well, in doing this, we are all going to tell the wrong people at some stage because we might misread someone. <laughs> so the first one is expect that people will tell you you're crazy. No matter how big or small the dream is, someone's going to tell you, oh, look out. So here's a few filters for how to get, guess if someone's the right person. Um, number one, do you want the experience that they're having? 
Because if you don't want the experience they're having, be that of their career, of their life, then their reaction is probably a blueprint to get exactly that. So if you're going to tell your friends, in her case, who are living in the city, who are not living on a farm, who are living a different life, what are they going to tell you? They're going to tell you the blueprint to get what they have because that's what they know and that's who they are. So just think, do I want the outcome someone has with this? So that's where you might go to someone who has actually done something before. Um, The second one is, is this someone who has a tendency to help make things happen? And in Jake's case, that was, she obviously knew her stepmother was that person who doesn't just say, oh, here are the problems, but says, hey, let's look realistically at what this would look like. Because there's a big difference between people who just go, oh, yeah, keep dreaming and keep you up in the clouds. And someone who says, yeah, let's take that. Here are three steps you can take. So look for people who have outcomes that you want. And secondly, who have that tendency. It's just being like, take advice from people who know what they're talking about. Right. So I want to talk about this moment. So I love that you say that Jake's you know, story is a masterclass in this. So she she has the idea she's willing to articulate her crazy idea to herself. Then she's willing to tell the right people. And then she's willing to do the practicalities of it. And then she enters, i.e. all of us who are willing to do this, the new world. And I'm thinking at this moment, Marianne, about the emotional landscape of the new world when we enter it, right? So in Jake's story, she shares about how her first impulse was to get out of the rat race, and then she leaves. But When she gets to the farm, there's all of this other stuff going on inside of her. And her story is her particular story. But I'm guessing that in your work with people, it's not just, I hate my job. I want to sell t-shirts online. Mm -hmm. It's, I I hate my job. I'm telling t-shirts online now. And now I'm looking at myself. (laughs) And kind of big stuff is coming up. Can you talk about that? Is that common? Yeah. So I can share my story here. I didn't hate my last job. I hated the job before that. (laughs) Didn't hate it. I just didn't want to do it in that way and live that way anymore. And what I didn't realize was my whole life was out of whack. And I didn't know that. If you'd come to me then and said, hey, your life is out of whack, I'd be like, no, I have a great life. Here's why. Three months after I quit my job, I broke up with my then partner who I was living with. That was a seismic shift. I broke up uh, my whole friendship group. I was suddenly in a recession, having started a business that wasn't paying properly yet. Um, And I was entirely had to figure things out on my own in a super expensive city, completely starting again socially. Uh, Who was I? I still had a few uh, friends who I was close to, but that isn't super unusual. It doesn't happen because you make a change. It happens because the change was only one thing that was off. So there's two different things that tend to happen with people. One of them is you make a start to make a shift and you realize, oh, (laughs) it wasn't just that. There is someone I'm growing into, someone who I've always been, who I'm taking the layers off. Because as you start your own business, starting your own business is one of the best personal development exercises you will ever do, even if you don't think it's about personal development, because you are your biggest asset. So we need to know who you are, where are your superpowers, where are the things you're not strong at? Because if you're spending time in those, you're not going to move forward. And then you start discovering, how do I talk about myself, especially if you're offering services? You really meet yourself. So it's not unusual to have a big change. As I was doing research in preparation of our conversation, I was thinking about how I had sought out talking to you because your work is around leaving the rat race and having a free range life. And I realized after listening to your TEDx talk and also through this conversation that it's really about the guts of life itself. It's really about who am I? What is this all about? Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of all of this? (laughs) Um, I don't know if that's where you take it. I'm really curious what you're really trying to do and how you're really trying to reach people. I always say that the idea of quitting your job and starting your own successful business, you know, gives you time and space is the gateway drug. I happen to be very good 
at marketing. I happen to be very good at positioning people, at, at strategy and all of those things. And so when it comes to that stuff, I can see how to take something and make it real and make it stand out and shine. But to me, that isn't the only point. To me, my work is actually about integrity. And by integrity, I mean being whole with yourself. And again and again, I've seen that firstly, that's what we're here for. You know, we think we just want to quit our job or change our business. It isn't just jobs, by the way. There's people in businesses that are wrong for them as well, or something's hit a wall. We think we want to make an external change. And we sometimes we actually do. Many times we do. But what we're really seeking is the feeling underneath that. The feeling and sometimes the time and the space that that change will give us to be able to say, this is who I am. This is where I feel like I'm in the right place. This is where I can bring all of myself to the table. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, if you don't do that, there will always be something off in your business because your business is probably around you and something isn't right. Something isn't moving forward. So to get really practical, you know, I talk about integrity with yourself, bringing all your, of yourself in. If you don't know exactly what, who you are or you are like, but that superpower isn't useful, your branding will be off, right? And if your branding isn't right, you're going to attract the wrong people who then won't buy from you. It's really simple. So for me, it's actually both. I'm not as interested in people just learning about themselves and then saying, but I'm now frustrated. I have to go back to doing something that isn't right for me. And I know all this. That isn't as interesting to me. I want people to go to that next level of learning and have tools to be able to do something about it. So I'd say it's both. It's the, the personal and the, the practical. You know, the show is called Full Moon Women. And so far, all of the guests have been women. But I still am curious about this. I'm wondering if you think women in particular have sort of an advantage or a disadvantage to making this kind of change to being a free range human, or if you feel like, no, this is just totally a human thing, or if you see sort of advantages or disadvantages particular to women. Hmm. Yeah, I see advantages and disadvantages in terms of how we're socialized. Yes, I see both of those. Um, one thing I see a lot that is more in people who were raised as women is the idea of questioning, can I charge that? That comes up more strongly for female clients than male clients. It's just something I've noticed over the years, questioning about um, our value in that sense, um, probably because we do a lot of unpaid labor. So there's a lot of things around, can I put that price on that? Whereas it is more likely, though not universal, that a man would probably in that same circumstance be like, of course I could. <laughs> so that's something I notice a lot and actually maps uh, things in the workplace about how women are less likely to ask for promotions and pay raises. So that's one thing I see and that's totally solvable. That's something we can learn a new mindset to. Uh, something that I see as, it, I'll talk more about feminine energy rather than men and women at this point, but something I see that's really positive in terms of feminine energy is when we are starting our own thing and we get to follow our intuition, um, which is, again, something that's traditionally associated with the feminine, although all genders have it. And that's so important because your intuition is going to be telling you a lot of things as you are making moves into new territory, as you are positioning yourself. And that's something we encourage a lot is how do you hone your intuition, get it to give you better information and how do you listen to it? So I think there's both. And I think also the idea of crafting a way of working that's more in line with our seasons is again, very feminine energy, right? So the idea of instead of putting ourselves into a box of this is how the work year has to go. This is how a day has to go. I believe that something women are very drawn to as cyclical creatures, full moon women, is to work seasonally. I believe it's a little different for all of us. But for example, for me, I find that my cycles are very intense. So I do most of my income earning in short periods and intense rest. So that's my cycle. It's not everyone's cycle. So I think for that reason, it's not really an advantage. It's a reason why I see a lot of women drawn to free ranging. It's a sense of, I get to set my time and my cycles and my year. That's such a relief to us. The last thing I wanted to ask you about is a personal question, which is, what are you excited about right now? 
my gosh, everything. <laughs> It feels like we're coming out of a winter, not just actual winter. Baby. Indeed. Right? I am. I'm excited about, number one, I, I feel like we're coming into a new cycle right now of people realizing there's another way available to them. And I live for these periods. I love this. Anything where people are questioning things, I'm like right in there. So I'm excited about that energy. Uh, I'm excited about this sense of possibility that... You know, I look back to when I started out, people, most people didn't know about the things that you could do, especially online. And now I look at a whole generation that's coming up and just has it as second nature. And I feel that the world is going in this direction where more and more people are realizing that they have a voice, that things are possible, and that things do not have to be as hard and heavy as we may have been conditioned to think they are. Yeah. Amen to that. Thank you so much for this energizing and insightful and grounded conversation. Truly. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Full Moon Women with the optimistic and tenacious Marianne Cantwell. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please subscribe or follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you are moved by this interview with Marianne, I invite you to leave her a voice message. We would love to hear from you, and so would she. Just go to the show notes and look for the link that says voice memo. You don't need to say something perfect or brilliant. Just a simple question or a simple thank you is wonderful. We may just include your message in an upcoming episode. As we shared earlier, current patrons of the show can access an exclusive video of Marianne reading from her best-selling book, Be a Free Range Human. That's live right now on Patreon. If you're already a supporter of the show, just go over to Patreon and check it out. And if you're not yet, I invite you to become a supporter of Full Moon Women. It starts at $3 a month. And as soon as you sign up, you unlock tons of super special, unusual content from our brilliant guests from around the world. This episode was produced by Pete Herkmans and myself. It was edited by Pete. I'm Jamie Younger, and you have been listening to Full Moon Women.